and, and so uh, music was was my thing. But as I became a teenager, you know, later on the hormones drop in, and I'm mad at everything. All of a sudden, my records no longer worked. Led Zeppelin records, as great as they are, the lyrics didn't address my issues. There's nothing saying I'm mad, I'm confused, I'm humiliated. I want to meet girls, but I'm such a screw up. I'm never going to so much as cop a feel. <laughs> and and there's Misty Mountain Hops and all of this stuff. Ted Nugent had songs about how great he is that didn't do anything for me. Van Halen lyrics, I had never had any idea what the hell they were so, As much as I like the songs, I don't. It wasn't my music, and I was very frustrated. And so Aerosmith, cool, but it didn't feel like my my music. And one day, a guy in my neighborhood, a buddy of mine to this day, Roberto, Bert, Bert Quiroz, Bert loaned me the first Ramones album. And I, I said, look at these four losers. You know, because they didn't look like ELO. What was this? And I was in an FM mindset. It, uh, but this won't sound like Steve Miller. And so I put the record on. And I got it after school, and I put it on, and I said, these guys can't play, what is this? And I can't stop playing this record. And so, by that evening, I played it like three times, and I realized my, my ship had come in, my life had a soundtrack. It was like these four outsiders who kind of looked weird at first, and then after playing the music, I'm like, my four alt dads. <laughs> and so I gave the record back, and Bert loaned me the first Clash album, which was a revelation to me, it's a perfect record. And uh, Joe Strummer instructing me to question authority. The idea of that was so alien to me. Like, I should not only question authority, but I should question it all the time. Like, all the time? Like, even in my sleep, Joe? <laughs> That's right, Henry. <laughs> oh, what a revolutionary concept. And just, yeah. And for me, Strummer, I bought in. I, was, I went for the full ride. I thought he was a professor. And like, uh, yeah. <laughs> What's he saying about it? I don't care. I'm with him. <laughs> All of a sudden I realized that punk rock was going to be something that I could, I, I, I was going to I was going to survive life because I had punk rock. All of a sudden my shield had an insignia. And uh, my best friend Ian Mackay, you know him from Fugazi, uh, he's my, been my best friend since uh, he was 11, I was 12, he's 53, I'm almost 55, we're still best friends. We discovered punk rock together. And every weekend we'd go out to this one record store that had import records, but he never had a job, so Henry, buy that one. And, and <laughs> one punk rock single, like an adverts single, was three hours of doing, or like one hour of doing something really awful, like shoveling kennels or parking cars, when I would buy these records. And we were always rewarded for our curiosity. This was the, the Buzzcock Spiral Scratch EP, the, the advert single, Stiff Little Fingers, and on and on and on, and damn, it's all good. And to this day, it's perfect music. And so I, I became punk rock because that was, my, that was my music. I had courage, and I was pushing back, finally. My life until then had been an inhale. I'm taking it, I'm taking it, I'm taking it. And with punk rock, I'm like, oh, my lungs are very full. Now it's time for the roar. And it was so gratifying to be able to go like, here I come. And, and have some, some weight behind it. And so I started going to punk rock gigs. And there's a really, well, it's bohemian and hip, and you can't afford it now, this part of Washington, D.C., called the Adams Morgan District. But back in my day, <laughs> when the uh, gates were coal-powered and the smoke was everywhere, uh, they have bloodlettings on, on the side of the stage, right, you know, house coals and stuff. Um, uh, this was a very scary neighborhood. It was really tough. And there was a hippie commune called Madam's Organ, a play on uh, Adam's Morgan, and they had punk rock gigs in the living room. It's just a house, uh, you know, a row house, with the living room, uh, the windows looked over the street, and bands would set up in the living room and play with their back to the street facing the living room, which is wavy linoleum, filthy with, you know, uh, puddles of beer and whatever other liquid uh, cigarette butts from the 14th century. And there's no real stage. So you could walk up and, like, smell the band, feel the music. And you could stand this far from the bad brains and just go, rock and roll is real. I'm feeling it. The guy just fell on me. I mean, this is happening. This isn't Led Zeppelin, which I, who I saw. And it was great. I saw them from, like, a mile and a half away. This was real. And we'd all be like, we having a good time. We didn't have any violence in our scene. We had gay people in our scene. We had uh, people who looked punk rock. We had Rastafarians in our scene. We just had weird kids who couldn't throw the ball straight, like me. Just people who didn't fit in. We all kind of fit in with each other. And 
everyone was fine. And so some band would be playing away like a thousand miles an hour, and all of a sudden you hear everything go out except the kick and snare. Like, da 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 da. Because one person had kicked the plug that, that powers the entire back line and all the instruments. Like, one plug, like, okay, can someone plug that in? And then someone like, in the leopard skin mini store, like, hold on. Oh, and the gig would resume. That's how low tech the whole thing was. This is basically a house party. And there was always a, a hippie uh, out at the door who would charge you bucks. But if you didn't have it, you'd like, I don't have it. And you're like, it's cool. <laughs> and I always wanted my two bucks because I reckon it keeps the thing going. And so one night, the Bad Brains had finished playing like two shows. And as good as you would think it would be, the Bad Brains were maybe in their 20th show in their entire lives. And it's like 1.30 in the morning, the, the thing has devolved into kind of a, a house party as people are shuffling around figuring out what are they going to do next with their, their night. And I'm just milling around, I got nowhere to go, I think I was living in my car around that time. And so I'm going to go to sleep in the fetal position in the back of a 1968 VW Fastback, mm -hmm. or I can hang out here. And I'd rather hang out on the filthy linoleum because the car is such a bummer. And so I'm hanging out, and someone uh, unplugs the PA, and they plug in a single speaker Norelco tape recorder with the one speaker, and they put in a punk rock mixtape, and they just put it on the floor. And I gravitate towards the music, and I'm staring down at the tape recorder that's looking up at me, and out come the adverts, x-ray specs, the clash, these bands that are in my, in my bone marrow. And I'm just loving it, I have the perfect music, I'm such a happy guy, with this single speaker. HR, the legendary singer of the Bad Prince, he comes up on the other side of the tape deck, and he starts dancing. And this guy is like a human gazelle. He's like Bruce Lee. There's, the, he, there's not one part of him. His fingernails are coordinated. <laughs> he was just this amazing guy, like this, this mini Hercules. Like, there's like this 28 inch waist. And his shoulders, he's and like no body fat. He's like this human sculpture. And he starts dancing. And the guy is just amazing. And I become so inspired by HR that I let myself go, and I start dancing too. And it doesn't look good, and I have no, no uh, coordination whatsoever, but it's real. And so HR doing all this stuff, I'm like, which is all I have. But for the first time in my life, I was completely free of wondering what anyone thought of me, because it was easy to shut me down. If someone had walked by and went like, you're a little stupid, I, I would have hid underneath my car for a year and a half. You know, it was easy to get to me. And so I'm jumping around. I'm in a room full of freaks freaking out. So no one's going, what are you doing? It's like, we're all a bunch of weirdos. He's like, he's doing what I'd be doing if I wasn't carrying out some crap piece of gear to a wounded vehicle. And so for at least 10 minutes, HR and I jumped around like, like you know, two wild men. And at that moment, I was smart enough to have this epiphany. I'm like, I'm free. This is as good as it gets so far. I was like 18 years of age. I'm like, I'm, I'm free. Uh, all I need to do is think free, have a little music maybe as a lubricant, you know, to kind of get me there, but freedom is all here, and I can feel like this is, as long as I'm brave enough to get on that idea. And then we both calmed down after a few songs and, you know, walked away as the music kept playing, and I never forgot that experience as long as I lived. You know, just because, like, the next day I'm like, wow, that was an amazing eight or eleven minutes of my life, that moment of feeling incredibly free. And I kind of would, I tried to live in it as I did everything else. I go back to my, my incredibly boring job, and I try and live in that moment of feeling free as I did one thing over and over for hours and hours as my feet would swell up, and I get all of like 3.25 an hour. And so I, I never f forgot that moment. Within a year, we are all seriously punk rock, not exactly dismissive, Kind of though, where I can't listen to Aerosmith anymore because it's not punk rock, but it's a really good record. Shut up! It's not the clash, and so this, this music no longer matters. And we became kind of rarefied. Like it's punk rock or it, it, doesn't, it doesn't merit. And one time I was at some house party around 1980, early 1981, and the Teen Idols, Ian McKay's band, had done, done some show, and it's just Oh, it's a living room full of like, you know, 20 people just being cool. And someone brings a record to the turntable to play for the rest of us. And I go, well, hold on a minute. I'll, I'll see if this record is uh, worth playing. And I take the record away from the guy, and I see these three hippies on the cover. 
And I'm like, that, no, 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 no. Three hippies, they don't look like they wash, they have facial hair. Uh, they look like, you know, like, like three terrifying people. You can't possibly think that we're going to tolerate this music. And he said, have you ever heard this record? I said, I, I don't, why would I want to hear it? They have long hair. It's not punk rock. And this person said, well, you might want to give this record just a little chance. How about we do that? Don't be so close-minded. I said, well, I am open-minded. I just know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like BS. Anyway, he puts this record on, and after a couple of songs, everyone uh, kind of stops and looks at the speakers with the same look on their face. Oh, no. Three hippie dirtbags uh, are playing music that has just incinerated our entire collective record collection. It's like, oh no, Stiff Little Fingers, Angelic Upstar, Sham 69, X-Ray Specs, The Clash, The Dam, The UK Subs, The Ruts, etc, etc. <laughs> oh no, and I grabbed the record, I said, let me see this damn thing that is changing my mind about what music can be. And this is the first time I heard Motorhead. Uh, <laughs> Slunk into a record store immediately. I'd like to get a pound of motor. Why are you wearing a paper bag over your head? Just, just, just sell me that. And um, me being that guy, I had to buy the single so I can get the B side because I'm that guy. Anyway, I uh, became a Motorhead fan very quickly. A lot of us did. And so we had to amend our conviction. I'm into punk rock! Dog, dog, wait for it, and Motorhead. And it wasn't like, I'm into music that I like. It was, I'm into, I'm into punk rock, so you know I'm real. And then I made a concession. Uh, it's part of, uh, you know, the Geneva Conventions. I, 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 I like Motorhead. Don't, they're very good. And it wasn't like, I like aspects of heavy metals. Like, I like Motorhead, they can hang, and it was a, a, a true crossover record and a true crossover band. And if you look at, Pictures of DC, Washington DC punk rockers from 8081. Quite often you'll see all the badges on the on the jacket, UK subs, damned, ruts, motorhead. And we all bought the motorhead button because the band was so damn good. And I was slinking into record stores as often as I could to kind of hang around people who like music. And I would read Enemy Sounds and Melody Maker, which would come over the Atlantic floating, wash up on the shores of Delaware, and get taken by trolley into the cities. And you'd get these like nine months later, and they were like three hours pay. So I never bought them, I would just read them. And I would read interviews with Lemmy, who seemed like the most straight ahead, no BS guy. And I started digging his look, I go, damn man, he's like a gunslinger without the gun. Like, what a, a true badass. And he made punk rockers seem like art school students. Like, I'm Johnny Rock, man. And, and I'm all into that. But I was like, I'm Lemmy. Let's do a line, you know. Where he seemed more cool and less like, I can't talk to you. He seemed like, I'll talk to anybody, man. Rock and roll. Woo! And I was too cool, and he was truly cool.